Hi, this is Claudia Sam, and I wanted to take some time to share with you my thoughts on inflation and U.S. monetary policy. Today's date is April 26, 2022. My views are, I'm sure, going to keep changing, but I thought it was useful to share with you a talk that I gave today on the topic. So I'm going to pull up my slides. All right, and okay. So um, like I said, that's the topic. And I'll start right out of the gate with the key takeaways. So inflation is high, unemployment is low. You all know that. Uh, inflation being high, this is a bad thing. Unemployment being low, this is good. Now, because of this reality, the Fed has very clearly shifted its focus. We're already seeing actions and we're definitely seeing them communicate intentions to further raise interest rates, sell off some of the assets on their balance sheet, all with the goal of cooling demand, not throwing us into a recession, having demand fall, just have it increase a little bit less and have it increase a little bit less until we get inflation coming down markedly. So the Fed has a dual mandate, price stability, maximum employment. I think we can largely say it's made a lot of progress on the maximum employment. And we can also say that we are not at price stability. So the Fed needs to address both of these and it is on it. Now, a lot of people have talked about the Fed was behind the curve. They should have raised interest rates last year. The fiscal policy was too big. We can have these debates. I'm sure there are many mistakes by policymakers and frankly, by all of us that have contributed to some of the problems that we have today. The reality is we are in a pandemic. Inflation was not transitory, but even worse and more tragically, COVID has not been transitory. So, and, and that's caused an immense amount of disruptions, you know, not just the supply chains, getting the inputs, the goods onto the shelves or in the car lot, but also in a lot of face-to-face -face services, people rightly so being afraid to be around other people doing the services. So we've seen a big disruption to the US economy. We've seen a big disruption to the global economy. Things are getting better, though COVID as it comes back in waves makes things worse, but we are, we do see a path forward. It's a very clouded one, tens of millions of people being on lockdown in Shanghai because of COVID just reminds us we are not out of this. It also reminds the Fed and other policymakers we cannot wait for the supply disruptions from COVID and now from the Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, to be that, you know, they work out and then inflation comes down. The Fed now accepts, and the White House and Congress absolutely support this, that they need to do what they can and what they can do is lower demand. And they are acting. I think it is extremely important, and I have written about this, I have spoken about this, this is not the 1970s. The Federal Reserve that we have, the central banks that we have around the world have more skills, more tools, and more credibility with financial markets, with businesses, and with consumers to the extent they pay attention to the Fed. Um, that is extremely important. We are very blessed to have the, our policymakers have those skills they're not perfect. They might not apply them in the way that is the absolute best, but they do have the skills and that that they did not in the 1970s. They didn't have all the tools and frankly, they didn't know how to use the tools that they had properly. And there was a lot of political inf interference from the White House in particular. We don't live in that world. All that said, uh, recently Janet Yellen, who is the Secretary of the Treasury, said that to get inflation down, the Fed needs to be skilled and we need to have some good luck in the world. The best luck we could have right now is getting COVID, the pandemic under control in the US and around the world and restoring peace in the Ukraine. 
that's that's the good luck. Take anything else we can get. Uh, our luck has not been good the last two years. So policymakers need to prepare for the worst. That's exactly what the Fed is doing and hope for the best. And here the hope is just steady as she goes. Don't, we could overdo it. This is not the moment to panic. Um, and I, I don't think the Fed will. So that's, that's good. Okay. Now there's a, there's a huge debate about why inflation is high. Any kind, the world is upside down and backwards and on fire. Okay, so anytime that we have a very complex, a very confusing situation, then we know without a doubt there are multiple factors that are at play. The, uh, the, remember, COVID is the root of all evil. This is why we shut the global economy down. This is why there was large fiscal. There would be no CARES Act. There would be no end of... 2020 uh, fiscal package, there would be no rescue plan if there had been no COVID, right? And supply chains would not have gotten messed up the way they are, and millions of people would not have died, right? So what we're seeing in this chart, backing it up to the numbers, this is a statistical analysis. This is not cherry picking out goods and services. This is a statistical analysis from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and what you are looking at here is the 12 month percent change. Here it's in the personal consumption expenditure prices. Uh, this is the, the index, the measure of prices that the Federal Reserve targets. Now I am showing you that measure excluding food and energy. The Federal Reserve has no tools to adjust food and energy. And frankly, they do, they are much more volatile. They move up, they move down. So the, um, the standard, the go-to is to really pay attention to what's happening at core because it tells us probably more about the trend than um, the total does. What you see in this picture, what their statistical analysis did, it separated goods and services into those that are COVID sensitive. Uh, some examples of this would be used cars, big durable items that you know have inputs from around the world and also service sectors like hospitality, airlines. Um, those, are, those are just some examples of these COVID sensitive sectors. What you can see here, they're noted in blue, that COVID sensitive goods and services, their price increases account for the, the, the vast majority of the, the inflation that we're seeing now and absolutely the step up inflation that we are seeing now. If you look at less COVID, so the COVID insensitive um, areas, you see, yeah, it's it's increased. And, and that is a worrisome sign is, you know, if, if the inflation starts spreading. Um, but it's, COVID is the story here. There's lots of other stories, the rescue plan, fiscal support, low interest rates. I mean, the goal of all those was to increase demand to get the recovery going. Increasing demand when you're in some kind of a supply crunch, and particularly if you increase demand quickly, well, prices are what adjust, right? So um, again, COVID is the root of all evil. COVID is the big driver of the inflation. Now, a glimmer of improvement that is that one can see in the consumer price index data for March that we received recently was that for the second month in a row, the month over month increase in the core, so excluding food and energy, for the second month in a row, it stepped down. In fact, it came in under expectations of market um, forecasters. That hasn't happened in a while, right? So, but two months is not, you know, we've seen it step down a few months before and then another wave of COVID comes and it steps up again, right? So, but it's, <clears throat> we'll take anything we can get in terms of progress. Now, the thing, if you look under the hood and you always should in these data releases, the thing that I found most heartening is that you used car prices fell notably. Now they are still just, extraordinarily high from before um, the pandemic, even before a year ago. I mean, they're up, you know, over 40% or about 40% from um, March of 2021. Now, the reason that I am um, encouraged 
is the the problem starts in the new car market because of supply chains the semiconductors can't get their other parts um, the auto producers in the united states and um, foreign producers they have had an extreme difficulty getting new cars on the lots they have not been able to meet the demand and that has made um, the result is some buyers of that would want a new car end up in the used car market it's a much bigger market but supply there hasn't um, increased a lot and then you have um, rental cars uh, companies that had sold off a lot of their fleet and now they're in the market too. So it just came together in a way that was just, I mean, new car prices have gone up and used car prices have gone up a lot, even more. So why is this good news that used car prices fell? Well, supply hasn't improved with the new cars. So that means that this is a softening of demand, or this is the most likely reason for what's going on. Um, car dealers would rather sell a car for 4% less than they did in February than like not sell a car at all. So there's um, consumers being more price sensitive in the surveys, they say now it's not a good time to buy a car. Why is that? Prices are high. I think prices will come down, right? So there is, and this is really important what consumers do, that's working in this direction. And, and then in addition, the Fed, as it has signaled its intention to raise interest rates, even before it does it, a lot of the interest rates that consumers and businesses face start going up. Interest rates are a price. They, you know, there's a sticker price at the dealership on the car that's been going up. You know, that's a price you have to pay. You got to bring in the money for the down payment. Um, the government put a lot of money in people's um, bank accounts last year. More people were able to cover the down payment and they got to have enough money to pay the price. The other price that they face if they take out a loan, which is very common, is the interest rate on that loan. That is gonna determine, and I mean, along with the sticker price, how much they have to pay every month. And if they are not able, don't have the financial means to keep up with those payments, they're not gonna get the loan. And even if they could get the loan, they shouldn't get it. And they likely wouldn't want to. I mean, we don't walk into this trying to make our lives um, really difficult in terms of money. Um, <clears throat> so the fact that we already are seeing some signs that demand is cooling, this is really good. Um, this is what we need to have happen in a lot of the interest rate sec uh, sensitive sectors. Uh, so in housing, in um, large large goods, durable goods purchases that, some, that often are um, use credit to pay for them. Okay. Now, you don't have to take my word for it that the Fed is on the ball and they're working on cooling demand and they're going to be raising interest rates. This is a quote from Jay Powell. At, this is a speech he gave at the National Association of Business Economics Policy Conference in March. I was there, I heard him say these words. I want to draw your attention to the last sentence here. We are committed to restoring price stability while preserving a strong labor market. Jay Powell is the real deal. The, the FOMC right now, they are the real deal. Like they are committed to the dual mandate. They are going to get inflation down. That is the piece of the dual mandate that they clearly are not in line with. So Jay Powell is not perfect. The FOMC is not perfect, but they know what they need to do right now and they will do it expeditiously, as he said. The Fed is also data driven though. If the data show that they are not doing enough and inflation continues to rise or it's not falling you know, fast enough, they will do more um, in terms of raising interest rates. And if they start to see signs in the data that they have overdone it, they will not move as expeditiously. Um, but it's clear in the next few months, they are going to be raising rates in March, or I'm sorry, May. So next week, they're almost certain, they're, they're going to raise the federal funds rates by 50 basis points. And it looks highly likely that they're on track for a June increase of 50 basis points. The Fed means it. And, and anything is on the table. I think they will raise as much as they think they need to, and they will try not to raise more than they need to. Okay, so the last thing that I wanted to share is why I am cautiously optimistic of a soft landing. So what that means is 
we right now we're in an environment of very strong growth, um, lots of jobs coming online, and <clears throat> the economy is running quote unquote hot. And, and higher inflation is a sign that we are running quote unquote hot. So what the Fed wants to do, and what policymakers want to do in general, is just slow it down a little bit. We don't want people to lose their jobs in mass. We just want, you know, instead of 5% increase in consumer spending, how about 3%? Unemployment might creep up a little bit, but like keep it under four, right? So 4%. So if the Fed were able to do that, if just the world, like, again, this is not all the Fed, if they would get there, um, particularly going into next year, then that is what's called a soft landing. A hard landing is where we we tumble into a recession. Um, Paul Volcker in the early 1980s led the Federal Reserve in really slamming on the brakes. They had a decade of high inflation. We have had one year. There's no reason right now for the Fed to slam on the brakes. There was a reason, or at least that was what the Fed thought it needed to do. I mean, it's not a science exactly how much, but they raised interest rates a lot. Like double digit and really high and really fast. And that led to a recession and it was a very severe recession. They actually had two recessions, a double dip. Um, that's bad. That is a hard landing, but it's not a soft landing. So the goal is a soft landing. I'm cautiously optimistic. My, um, I have about a 60% chance of a soft landing. Um, that leaves about 40% of you know what I think we could go into a recession, I think the bulk of that would be, the most likely case within the recession would be a um, milder recession, something like 2001, where you see the unemployment rate increasing, but nothing like, say, an increase in the Great Recession or the COVID recession, which were severe. Um, I put a very, very low weight on a severe recession. So like the really hard landing that we got in the early 80s. Um, or our last two recessions that were severe. Okay, now there are other, there's a wide range of opinions about how likely a soft landing is. You have um, <clears throat> forecasters at Goldman Sachs, a very competent shop of, um, they have put their recession odds at 35%. So this is very close to the where I am in terms of my thinking about how likely a recession is next year. And there are plenty of people who are much more pessimistic. Uh, Larry Summers put out his um, uh, recession analysis recently, and he had estimates of a recession, the odds of it at about 60, uh, 67% this year, particularly next year. Um, and uh, that's, that's really high. Now, he is not alone. There are plenty of other um, people watching the Fed, watching the economy, including former Federal Reserve officials that are very pessimistic about the Fed or just policymakers in general, getting us to the other side of this without a recession. Now, why am I cautiously optimistic? Why is my most likely forecast a soft landing? So I, and this goes back to, well, basically I think the United States has cushion. And they've got a cushion unlike really any country in the world. And this goes, this cushion relates directly back to the actions of the Federal Reserve in 2021, continuing to keep interest rates very low, effectively at zero, and of Congress who early in 2021 passed the American Rescue Plan. No other country like us put out another round of um, fiscal relief in 2021. Um, those, the Fed policy, the Congress, those without a doubt contributed to some of the increase in inflation. I have the opinion that COVID was the real culprit, but a percentage point, two percentage points, I think that's entirely possible with the um, massive amount of relief that has gone out since the beginning of the COVID crisis. So I get it. Now, the benefit of these this big push from Congress, the White House, and the Federal Reserve is that we have a recovery that is incredible. Um, 
you what I show you here on the left, this is consumer spending even after you take into account the higher prices. So this is what you walk out of the store with, what you have at home, what you bought. It's not the price tag, it's what you actually have. And you can see that we are now back on the pre-COVID trend. Not the pre-COVID level, we are well past that. We are on the trend that's really important and it is very different than what happened after the Great Recession where we were missing a lot of that fiscal relief and the Fed frankly didn't um, do enough either. We never returned to the pre-Great Recession trend for consumer spending. Now, these two recessions are very different. I don't want to, you know, and, and policy is really hard to do in real time. And the political constraints were different back after the Great Recession than they are now. But the most important point is we're back on trend. People, while they are paying more and they're really not happy about it, I hear you, but they, they're getting more stuff. And this is, and this is also the place where you can see consumer spending has been growing at a very fast clip. We can cool that down. Instead of 5%, 3% would be just fine this year. Um, we don't have to have it decrease by 3%. That's a recession. Just slowing it down, totally fine. Okay, the other, um, the other chart on the right, and I think this is a win uh, for, the, for the US economy, for the American people that is not discussed enough is on business investment. So what I'm showing you here, this is, um, business investment, which sometimes we call capital investment. And this is uh, things like equipment and research and development and structures, not residential structures, but like the warehouse that Amazon builds. Uh, so these, the business investment, these are private businesses, is back, it's nearly, not not as clearly as, as consumer spending, but it's getting pretty close to its pre COVID trend um, is definitely past the level. If you look back at the Great Recession, again, we never hit that trend. And we really, like, it took, it took a long time to get that going. And business investment is particularly important because it, I mean, it adds to GDP when the businesses do it. You're creating capital or just the tools to produce in the future. So it's going to be tied to how much future GDP is future growth, jobs are tied to growth. And, and that's also very important because um, you have to have the tools for the workers to be effective. So we talk a lot about productivity, higher productivity is the holy grail of progress um, and standard of livings. It's not enough, it needs to be equitable, but it's, it's really important. And to have business investment come back like this, this is it could be a real blessing in terms of preserving productivity growth. Um, so none of this, this does not make a slam dunk case that we will have a soft landing. This is extremely encouraging and inflation was really bad, is really bad. This, what I'm showing you here, the consumer spending, the business, this is really good. You add up the unemployment rate, this is really good. So, you know, we're not all the way to the finish line. Policymakers should not be doing a victory dance, um, but we have made a lot of progress and that progress could come in real handy when we're trying to slow things down just a little bit, but not cause a recession. All right, well, thank you. That is what I wanted to share with you today. If you have any questions, put them in the comments to the Substack. If you think I'm missing something and you have a different opinion, put those in there too. And of course, if you agree, that's nice too. Um, so again, thank you for tuning in. I'm sure I will have much, much more to say about these topics. So have a good day. Bye.